You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome and welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Carver and I, Niels Kostrup Larsen, where each week, we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, let me start by saying welcome, with the hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity and hunger for learning, enough to check out the back catalog and listen to the past episodes that you may have missed. Like last week's conversation with Rich, where we discussed the misconception of volatility as risk, we also had some thoughts on the various measures of risk and drawdowns as an opportunity to buy the dip in the trend-following strategies. So if you missed that episode, I invite you to check it out, as well as, of course, the midweek episode that was published yesterday with Cam Harvey, which we'll come back to a little bit later. Now, as you may know, the aim of the podcast is to democratize the hedge fund, CTA, or quant investment world, whatever you prefer to call it. And if you want to be part of our community and this journey, what we ask of you is that if you can comment, if you can send us your question, if you can share these episodes, and not least, if you can rate and review them in iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it. Because this is the way for us to see that you're getting some value uh, from our time and dedication each week to create these episodes. And as long as that continues, we'll continue to do them. With all that said, Rob, great to be back uh, with you this week after a very interesting month of November. How are you doing? How are things in the UK? And are you getting into the holiday spirit yet? Uh, yeah, actually, my, my wife and my youngest daughter have just gone off to buy our Christmas tree. So we'll we'll be decorating the house this afternoon and crossing our fingers that that we don't go into like a Christmas lockdown because uh, <laughs> with, with the Omicron variant, they are starting to reintroduce rules on mask wearing indoors and and such like. So yeah, we're, we're kind of crossing our fingers that that we're going to have a, hopefully a pretty normal Christmas. Yeah, well, at least you have the tree secured. So that's, uh, that's the beginning, right? Absolutely. Now, in terms of a market wrap this week, uh, treasury yields drifted uh, higher and stocks closed at or near record highs in somewhat muted trading this week. The price action was a little bit surprising given the outsized economic data reported. The least watched, but nevertheless a key number, the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey, also known as JOLTS, counted 11,033,000 available and unfilled jobs in the U.S. economy. That was only the second instance that JOLTS topped more than 11 million. The second economic surprise was initial job claims for unemployment insurance, which turned uh, in a number of 184,000 applicants for the week ending December 4th. That's the lowest number of claimants in 52 years. Now, there may be some seasonal adjustment that have helped uh, to put, put in this number, but that doesn't diminish the direction of the claims, especially when you take in the, uh, into account the, the jolt surprise. And the rise in consumer price index of 6.8% year over year was not exactly a surprise since it matched consensus expectation but it was the highest rate since 1982. Coincidentally, that was near the beginning of Paul Volcker's tenure as arguably the most hawkish Fed governor ever. That's not to imply that the Fed is going to need to take the overnight rate to 22% as Volcker did, but the cocktail of economic data is likely to make the Fed chairman's post-FOMC press conference briefing an uncomfortable one next week. Granted, he has joined the chorus of Fed governors and presidents calling for a more accelerated taper, but it's only been a month since he voiced that opinion. That his reading of the economy has been so wrong for so long should arm the press corps with plenty of pointed questions. All right, Rob, let's talk about what has uh, been standing out to you in the last month or so in terms of market's performance and, and also to use uh, Rich's phrase, How's your battleship doing? <laughs> I think it's fair to say that that uh, towards the end of last month, my battleship took a, a big broadside and uh, took on some water, but it's still afloat. Um, but yeah, before that, though, um, I think last time we spoke, I said I wouldn't want to be uh, a central banker right now. I'm not sure I'd want to be um, a sell-side economist either, because those guys also have to try and interpret this economic data. And, you know, it's very, very hard to, to square 
what, what's going on. The, the, the numbers coming from different parts of the economy are very confusing. And, you know, it's very hard to come up with a with a, a policy or a recommendation that would really fit, you know, across all the different sectors of the economy. Because some, yeah, high interest rates, tight policy makes sense. Other parts of the economy are still in serious bad shape. But anyway, enough about the macro picture. Let's get down to the micro for, for me personally. So as this is my last um, um, podcast, just me this year, I'll I'll do uh, a few more detailed numbers. So let's start with last month then, because it, it uh, obviously um, was a, a pretty unpleasant experience for, for a lot of people. And I, I certainly didn't miss out on that. And it all really happened on Black Friday. Um, and also the following Tuesday was pretty unpleasant. It was a bit of a rebound on Monday. So the kind of net net loss for that month for me was down 9.7%, which is, you know, a pretty ugly number, just shy of a two digit loss. It's actually my largest loss in, in, in live trading, although I have seen uh, bigger losses in, in backtesting. So it's not like a complete shock and surprise to me. Um, and in terms of where those losses fell, um, you know, so the, the kind of energy complex hurt was obviously very hurt badly on that day. And I was hurt with long positions in things like heating oil and gasoline, but also, um, you know, hurt in terms of um, sort of long, long stock positions, gains quite, quite rare. I made a bit of money in Bitcoin, ironically, last, <laughs> last month. So that, no, no, thank, thanks for that. So yeah, down 9.7% last month. For um, the um, the year as a whole, then up till today or yesterday, to be precise, and that puts me down minus five. So that that month's kind of plunged me from a, you know, a kind of okay profit into a, a bit of a loss for, for the for the year so far. Um, and um, you know, the, again, some familiar stories there. Euro dollar's not been very kind to me this year. That's much of my biggest loss in the year to date numbers. You know, some of the energy markets there, heating oil. Uh, on the positive side, um, quite quite a variety of, of markets where I've made money. Actually, quite a lot of equity markets. Obviously, we've had you know a long rally which was broken, but but still made kept quite a lot of profits from that. Um, and the final set of numbers I'll talk about because it's obviously tedious just just to go on and on about various numbers. But I think it's always interesting for me to do um, my kind of week, you know, the last week because those are the numbers you'll give me just just as a comparison. So last week I clawed back some of that November loss um, was up two percent last week. Um, gains in in equities, um, in VIX, and also in crude. And, and I guess what's happening there is, although I reduced my positions, they didn't actually change sign because my system, you know, is the, 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 the trends, longish trends in the system um, carry perhaps didn't reverse, you know, have not reversed yet. So I'm still holding on to those positions and I'm benefiting from a bit of a rebound in those markets. Uh, on a forward-looking basis, um, so I measure my risk as a sort of expected annualized standard deviation. That my system's calibrated for that to be an average of twenty five percent a year, which is quite punchy actually. Um, during the the, the kind of uh, first couple of days after Black Friday, when my system was still reducing risk, so risk had gone up, but my positions hadn't reduced to compensate for that yet. So I, I, you know my risk had exploded as a result, and it was up to sort of thirty seven, thirty eight, forty percent, which is very high for me. Um, but now my positions have been reduced, and because the my backward looking risk estimates, obviously there's been a you know, a week, a week or so, of slightly quieter markets now. My backward-looking estimates have started to drift down a little bit. Um, so the net effect of that is my risk actually now is very low. It's just under nine percent a year, which is, uh, you know, is obviously what's that? About a third of my target. So pretty low. Um, so I am still short VIX, for example. Um, I'm still long crude, but um, you know, I'm, I'm I've only got positions now in I think about twelve markets. So I've closed an awful lot of my positions on the back of that very savage movements uh, last month so yeah the still still holding on i mean th th this is the game we play isn't it we we try and uh hold on to the, uh, the 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 trends when they come and then when they move against us we we have to you know we reduce our our risk we close our positions and we try and preserve what's left of our capital for the the next opportunities to arise so uh so yeah the, the battleship is still just about just about afloat yeah, no, that's always good to hear, of course. Now, uh, very interesting, by the way, thanks for sharing the thing about the risk. Now, when you say that it's now at around 9%, does that mean that actually in the, in the coming days uh, that you would automatically start increasing your position size to get back to 25? Or how does it actually work? So if my all my forecasts are at sort of average, and if, if the market correlations are kind of typical of what I've seen in my back test, then I'll be at 25%. Now, because there's been these these savage sell-offs, that means that um, you know my forecasts are lower than they were before the sell-off. So, my system's saying, you know, I don't really know what's going on here. 
I'm going to wait and see if things become a bit clearer. You know, maybe markets will continue being volatile or or moving in the wrong direction, in which case my risk may even reduce further. Or maybe, you know, we'll see previous trends resuming, in which case I'll start to build risk gradually again. But yeah, it'll be, you know, if I see 25, 25 you know, by the next time we talk in, say, January, February, um, when I'm on the podcast again, um, I'd be surprised if, if I see 25 before then. I might be up to 25 in, you know, four or five weeks' time. But but yeah, I think it'll take a while for the, the things to become clear enough for the system to react in that way. Yeah, okay, no, that, that's very helpful. And by the way, I don't actually think your monthly loss was that bad compared to your level of volatility, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah. And, and what's interesting about this year is really that you see seemingly sort of similar sort of uh, trend strategies delivering very different results, right? I've certainly seen a number of managers who are after November, you know, slightly down for the year. And there's a few who are up a lot still, even after giving back a lot, they're still up a lot. Um, And then, of course, there's anything in between, but it's just been, I can't actually think of a year right now where I've seen so much dispersion in returns, um, which kind of is is, is a good thing, I think, because it shows that we are doing things differently, even though... I think a lot of people think of trend following as being, oh, they're doing, they're all the same. Look at their correlation; it's 0. 0.7. They're all the same, but no, we're certainly not the same when you drill down to it. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at some kind of quantitative measure of dispersion um, and, and say compare it to last year, because last year you would have expected dispersion, because we, mm-hmm. you know, whenever we have these sharp V shapes, we know that will produce dispersion in terms of people who are trading at different speeds, and also in terms of their, um, you know, their allocation across um, asset classes. So. So yeah, maybe maybe if someone has the the statistics to do that, they could try and get some uh, returns across managers and tell us how dispersion differs this year versus last year. That would be an interesting. I'm sure figure. there will be some papers out of that in, yeah, in yeah. January potentially. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, on our, on our side, um, this was also a good week for us. Sort of the first full week of December was actually uh, pretty pretty good. Gains came mostly from uh, our equities, energies, and fixed income positions. So pretty much the markets that you know, are rebounding now from the Thanksgiving tran- tantrum. Currencies and metals, we were flat, uh, soft and grains. Probably we saw small losses for the week. And directionally, we, uh, we're still positioned more or less in the same uh, direction as we were before Black Friday. So still kind of, you could say, it, the model, quote unquote, and I, I have to put this carefully, expects, which it doesn't, but expects kind of this opening slash reflation trade to continue in the economy. My trend barometer moved, you know, hasn't moved much actually recently, but it's still weak. Uh, it closed at 30 last night. So it is confirming a more difficult environment for trend following, which obviously we've seen in the last few weeks, but um, would be nice if it starts moving up to the positive territory. In terms of volatility trading, the first full week of December continued this roller coaster ride that we've seen in the previous, say, one and a half weeks in terms of volatility, at least, uh, even though a more clear direction, it was established and the S&P 500 moved above 4,700, again, gaining three and a half percent this week. The VIX index, uh, that also declined significantly, more than 11 points, and it's now below 19 uh, as these Omicron fears are easing a bit. But even the strong rally in stocks didn't change the high sentiment of the VIX to, um, you know, any S&P 500 decline. And this was really true on Thursday, where we had a 0.75% decline in the S&P, and that sent the VIX up by 1.7 point, which is quite a lot. The volatility of the VIX itself is the highest in comparison to the volatility of the S&P 500 since 2018, even trumping the COVID-19 shock mar- uh, stock market uh, dive in March of 2020. Uh, in terms of our volatility strategy, it remained sort of long of volatility of volatility throughout the week. Uh, it actually didn't have a down day at all uh, for the week. Um, but despite relatively large positions, it was, um, you know, a, a modest gain of 78 basis points uh, for the week. Maybe to finish on a lighter note, I saw that um, CBS News reported this week that the Saudi authorities have conducted their biggest ever crackdown on camel beauty contestants that receive Botox injections and other artificial touch-ups with over 40 camels disqualified from the annual event. 
How about that, Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually grew up in, in the Middle East in Dubai, so um, yeah, yeah I, I've probably spent more time with camels than yeah. quite a few people listening to this podcast. Um, and I have to say, um, camels are not pretty. So they need the Botox, is what you're saying? I think in terms of the, you know, the camel's self-esteem, I think that, that, you know, that they should be allowed to do what they need to do, personally. Okay, fair enough. Okay, all right. Anyways, in terms of my own trend-following model, um, where I can be more detailed, of course, it was a down week um, for this model. Uh, it is shorter term in nature than what we do uh, at Dunn, so it's uh, not surprising that it was caught a little bit in this rebound. Down 3.3% for the week, oh, sorry, for December so far, and up uh, just 3.12% year to date. So also giving back quite a lot of the uh, earlier profits of the year. Group 1 models this uh, month to date are down 50 basis points. Group 2 up about 22 basis points, but all the action really is happening in the fast reacting models. They're down 3%. Again, that's natural because that's where they made the money in November, kind of saved that month. Um, but then the reversals in, December's, uh, in December is now hurting a bit. In terms of sector attributions, the month so far, well, grains and nothing else is where we've seen a little bit of profits. And in terms of the downside, it's all equities that's losing uh, money this month and nothing else. Single markets, um, you know, there really isn't any single market standing out in terms of positive side right now. And at the bottom, it's just the DAX with also some small losses in the 10-year note. In terms of where the portfolio is positioned right now, there are a few more short positions that we've seen um, compared to earlier this year, like the Aussie dollar, SPY, British pounds, cocoa and the euro, uh, palladium as well. And then long positions, um, you know, DAX, gold, German bunds, copper coffee, live cattle, NASDAQ, to name a few. And in terms of the risk, just like you, Rob, uh, it's very low at the moment. It's down to 5.47% if everything gets stopped out on Monday. That's down from 7% last week. So uh, that's a, a quite a low and, uh, yeah, risk-averse number. All right, Rob, we've got um, some great topics from you, of course. And also um, we've got a couple of questions from uh, Abi that actually I had forgotten his uh, question last week, so I apologize for that. But then we have both questions today. But before I do that, you asked me um, a couple of months ago to remind, to ask you, how is your book coming along? So I'm just going to take that opportunity and say, how is your book coming along? It's going okay. I, I put a thing on Twitter saying I've written over 100 pages. And I still haven't mentioned trend following. So maybe I should uh, maybe I should start. What book are you writing, Rob? <laughs> I know. It's not, only, it's not going to be a bestseller if oh, you continue clearly, like that. Clearly, yeah. I mean, as you'll know, um, Neil, so you've done a bit of writing yourself. The hard part is trying to leave out the stuff that the reader doesn't really care about. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I'm like, oh, this is a very fascinating result. And the reader's like, no, Rob, we don't care. Right. A hundred pages in and, and, and you've just written a lot of fascinating results. We just want some practical advice. So um, I'm constantly reminding myself I don't need to put in, uh, you know, too much too much uh, kind of sort of theory and stuff and get straight to the, the nuts. And the other thing, of course, is the opposite problem, which is, writing stuff and then thinking, actually, it does, you know, have I actually explained enough to the reader so far that they're going to understand what I'm going on about? Mm -hmm. um, or are they just, just going to be like, you know, what, what, sorry, what, Robbie, we're using the, some jargon you haven't defined yet or some, uh, some, um, you know, some, some methodology you haven't actually fully explained. So, so that's the challenge for me, but uh, yeah, it's going okay. Fingers, fingers crossed. Okay, good, good, good. Now, speaking of writing, I can say that actually just yesterday, I published the first blog post uh, after I redid the website. It's a post that's uh, written by Rich and, and me. And it is kind of the, the detailed version of the uh, short article we wrote for uh, Nordic Hedge, their uh, annual CTA event. And it's all about how you or how we think you can actually completely replace the 40 in the 60-40 portfolio with a portfolio of CTAs using a specific methodology to select those managers. And what we're going to do is if each month we're going to actually follow up. And I will post once we get time to do it. I will post the whole year of monthly reports. Um, it's really my bad because it's taken so long to get the website uh, in the condition where we could do it. But, uh, you know, we have been doing these uh, monthly updates to see how that particular portfolio selection of managers uh, was doing so far this year. So there'll be a new feature coming out every month, obviously a few weeks into the next month, we need all the data. But at least now there is a full detailed explanation as to how we are selecting the managers 
of course, completely rules-based, and we'll see how that continues. Now, back to the question, the first question from Abi. So um, let's deal with that, Rob. Abi writes, I'm a relatively new to the podcast, and it has quickly become my number one source for entertaining and reliable trading insights. Thanks for your hard work. And all the free content. Not so sure about the entertaining part, Rob. Maybe well, it's, it must be you he's referring to. It must to. be my, my jokes yeah. about camels. Because I like to make very clear that was a joke about camels. I don't think you should inject Botox into animals. Just in case <laughs> there's any animal rights people listen. Okay, but humans are fine, not but just not animals. Yeah, do what you want to your own body. But yeah, not animals. <laughs> all right, back to the, the serious part of what we do today. Uh, Abby continues, I'm starting to build a systematic trading approach, but I'm nowhere near going live yet. My question is about when I should start switch, when I should switch strategy. For instance, when trend following strategies are in an uptrend, obviously I should be trading a trend strategy. But what about when trend following is in a downtrend? Should I then switch to mean reversion strategy or a risk parity strategy, assuming one of these is in an uptrend? I think I would personally be uncomfortable advertising my strategy as trend following bracket if I should go on to manage outside money, uh, as is my long-term goal, and then trading a trend following strategy even when such strategies are in a downtrend, as this intuitively feels more like a mean mean reversion. And then the question, I guess, do you only trade uh, a strategy when it's in an uptrend? If not, why not? All right, I think we need to dig a little bit deep here with Abby to get so certain things clear, Rob. I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, so the, the question is, do, does it make sense to turn on and off strategies? Um, and actually, it doesn't really matter whether you're switching from trend following to mean reversion or just maybe reducing the risk on your trend following strategy until you think it's going to do well. I think the basic principles are probably the same. So th there's, a, there's a two things you need to think about. The, the first one, which is very easy to say is cost. So obviously, if you're switching from a strategy that does one thing to a strategy that does another thing, then, you know, the kind of positions you would have on in that scenario would be different, right? So the, you know, if you, you and I are running a trend following strategy and a mean reversion strategy, and we look to the positions they had on today, it's quite likely they'd be quite different. In, in many cases, there would be the same positions with a minus sign in front of them, right? So, you know, it'd be quite, quite a different portfolio. So if you're going to switch from one to the other, then that's going to incur some trading costs. Um, so you need to think very carefully about, well, like the the sort of the process or the, the time it's going to take you to switch from one to the other and how often you you kind of do that sort of well, rebalancing. It's effectively kind of rebalancing, isn't it? Um, so if someone says to me, um, I've got a trend following an amino universe strategy, I'm going to switch between them every week. I mean, <laughs> I'd probably say that was insane. Because, you know, the trading costs are going to absolutely kill you. So we're, we're probably looking at switching, let's say, at, at, at least a few months, if not a year, you know, every year. I would I would imagine for the, the, the cost to make sense. Maybe you can do it a bit quicker, but, but you know, to, to me that feels about right. So the second, and this is the really hard thing, <laughs> is to say, well, can we actually predict several months, maybe a year in advance, what the the absolute or the relative performance of a particular strategy is going to be. Um, and can we do that by simply looking at the account curve of the strategy and saying, well, if this thing's in an uptrend, for example, do I expect that to continue? Or do I expect it to, to mean revert? In other words, a good performance in a strategy, say this year, means you're more likely to get a bad performance next year or vice versa. Or is there no information there at all? You know, is there is there no not really any way we can just look at the account curve and decide whether to switch between a particular strategy? Now, my experience and the analysis and research I've done into this is that if anything, trend following is a mean reversion account curve. So let me explain that because that that sounds like complete nonsense. But basically, if you look at the performance of trend following over a period of six months, a year, and you look at um, what statisticians call the autocorrelation of returns. In other words, how likely is it that a positive return will follow a positive return? That correlation is actually weakly negative. In other words, a very good performance in trend following this year means it quite likely there'll be a less good performance next year. And that what that means is that the absolutely the last thing you should do is trend follow your trend following strategy. In other words, when the strategy is going up, put more money into it and vice versa. 
Um, and this is particularly irritating if you manage money because a lot of clients, of course, tend to do that. So they, they think, well, I believe in trend following, but I'm also going to trend follow my trend following managers and put more money into trend following when it's profitable. And that's not quite optimal. It's not quite the best thing to do, um, I would say. So me personally, I don't do any of this stuff. <laughs> I have a fixed allocation to the different sources of of beta or alpha, or however you want to think about it, risk premia, you know, trend following immune version carry and so on and so forth. And my hope is that if one of those things is doing well, the other one's doing badly, well, they'll offset each other and I'll get a benefit and vice versa. I don't try and time these strategies at all. Um, I, I've, as I said, there's, a, there's some weak evidence that you can do a little bit of almost anti-trend following in your account code for trend following specifically, but it's very, very weak evidence indeed. Now, mean reversion, and I'll, then I'll let you um, address the point, Niels. Just quickly, mean reversion, the way that tends to behave is a sequence of good returns and then drops, sharp drops, and then it recovers, right? So it's a classic negative skew, skew strategy, mean reversion, usually. And that implies that, you know, there may be some value in trend following that. So it's the opposite of trend following. But again, it's a very, very weak effect. And I, I would be... So it's just in terms of, you know, the hassle, the complexity, the potential higher trading costs. For me personally, I just stay away from trying to time uh, these these factor exposures completely. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to go to the next question and then maybe add what um, my thoughts to that. Uh, the only thing I just want to um, to add right now uh, for, for you, Arby, is that, um, and it goes to, of course, the point about, you know, have you any way of knowing when your trend following strategy is not going to work. All I want you to think of right now is the fact that on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, everything worked really well for trend following. It looked like you had the perfect portfolio. And by the close of business Friday, everything looked complete opposite. So I completely agree with Rob. The ability for us to know when to be a trend follower and when not to be a trend follower, I think you have to conclude that that is impossible. But anyways, you go on to another, you send another question, which I actually think is probably more interesting in some ways. So you're right. In today's episode, so that must have been the last week's episode with Rich. In today's episode, you touched upon the aspect of buying the dip as long as the strategy is robust. You also noted that trend following returns are, or rather have been historically very attractive going forward when in drawdowns. I've seen some uh, the same phenomenon in equity indices as well. Are they quote unquote robust strategies? Question mark. Does this mean I should be buying the S&P 500 when it's in a drawdown as well? Question mark. I've heard Jerry says he buys S&P 500 futures during uptrends, breakouts, not drawdowns and breakdowns. How do I know if a strategy is robust and if buying the dip is widely accepted trend following strategy? Question mark. As a new trend follower, I must say I find the concept of buying the dip feels a bit like going against the trend. I am only supposed to uh, am I only supposed to buy the dip in trend following strategy specifically? Question mark. If so, why are uh, if so why are they a special case? Question mark. Maybe this would be a good discussion for uh, for the bumper Xmas Christmas period. Oh, sorry, e episode, uh, which I look forward to. Yes, absolutely, Abby. So, so let me dive in on this one first. So, I, I think there's a couple of things we need to get clear, Abby. Is that if you are a trend follower, you can never buy the dip in the actual market because it will go against the trend. Right, the trend is down, so you need to be short or you need to be going short. So, so you don't you don't want to confuse what we say by buying the dip in the trend following strategy. That's completely related to kind of an entry point for when you want to either allocate to trend following or whether you want to increase your allocation to trend following or whether if you're managing money and, and a client comes in, you know, is there any way to kind of advise them when to start allocating to you? The only thing I can say that I found in my 30 plus years doing this is that I would, of course, much rather buy into a trend following strategy after it's been in a drawdown of some sort. And and the simply comes back to Rob's point, the, the strategy is mean reverting, so they tend to do really well uh, after a drawdown. 
So that that's to me kind of, you know, yeah, I would feel quite comfortable doing that. But no, you need to kind of just focus on what trend following really does for you in 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 a in in a strategy context and that is you buy the highs, you sell the lows and uh, and that's exactly what you refer to as Jerry saying that he's buying uh, S&P during uptrends and breakouts. He would never be selling uh, none of us would be selling uh, during uptrends and breakouts to the upside. So so don't confuse these things with buying the dip of the strategy, meaning just allocate to it when it's in a drawdown, and what we actually do inside the strategy. Those are two very different things. Um, Rob, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think especially as a beginner, I, I wouldn't worry about sort of quote-unquote trading the strategy at all. I just have a, right. a, a, you know, put money into the strategy understand how the strategy works as you say if it's pure trend following it shouldn't be buying dips it should be during sell-offs it should be going short and then when the market starts to recover going long and you know what actually if if it's a fastish trend following system it may look a little bit like it's buying the dip because if you if you can kind of visualize the market say last year selling off and then start to recover a, a kind of quickish trend following system would have started to buy probably a few days after that dip and you could have pointed that and say, look, look, you're buying the dip. But actually, you weren't. You were buying the short uptrend that had occurred. And you're only seeing that because you're trading pretty quickly. So, yeah, gen- generally speaking, the actual s- strategy in terms of its trading shouldn't be shouldn't be um, buying dips if it's pure trend following. Of course, you know, it's perfectly valid to have a mean reversion type strategy that does buy dips. But, but you know, that that's completely different. And you should understand the different risk profile of that. But, yeah, keep keep things simple and just, just trade the strategy and... You know, it's it is very hard, very hard to get get um, you know the timing of buying and selling the strategy on top of trading the strategy as well. As a beginner, I and I don't do it. Um, you know, uh, it's very hard to get right. And as a beginner, I'd, I'd stay well away from that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and, and actually, Abby, I would just uh, recommend that you get some of Rob's books, frankly, and also the book from uh, Andreas Klino, um, following the trend. It has some really good, simple examples as to how to to build a simple uh, trend following strategy. Um, So I think that's a good starting point for that. Now, Rob, before we move on to uh, your topic of today, I actually want to bring up, well, we had a conversation with with uh, Cam Harvey um, and that was published uh, only uh, uh, a couple of days ago, I think it was, um, but it was actually one of the most uh, really, really interesting and, and also a really important topic to be discussing right now because he and a couple of other uh, man AHL uh, people have written a book called Strategic Risk Management. Um, and of course, what we often say on the podcast is that although people think of us as someone who just focusing on how much money we can make, we actually focus much more time on on the risk management side of things. And and their book actually goes to to that point. So for those who haven't listened to it, go back and listen to that episode. Um, and and but more importantly, I wanted to hear your thoughts, your kind of takeaways it's rare we get a chance to discuss a recent episode like this but what were your takeaways you you worked uh, with uh, cam at ahl uh, you have obviously followed his work uh, for for many many years um and then having a chance to discuss some of these thoughts uh, and and ideas uh, i'm curious what you what you took away in particular yeah i mean it it's i think i said in the the episode that for me the first time i met cam was like meeting one of the beatles because um you know he he's um uh, and not just a, a brilliant academic researcher, but the the research that he does is is ex, is incredibly relevant to to what we do. Um, and um, he, you know, the the way he explains and articulates his ideas and and stuff is is fantastic. He, I would love to be one of his students at, at Duke. I have to say, it would be must be a great a great teacher. So um, so yeah, he he's um, has been a consultant to um, to various parts of man group for many years and uh uh yes when i was at ahl um he was an, an academic consultant and um you know we had some some great conversations um so yeah i definitely listened to the episode in term in terms of the the insight it's just just incredible so i'm just in terms of picking out a couple of things from that episode um so um 
One was, you know, one of our favorite topics on the podcast, which is volatility targeting, uh, which is obviously interesting to always hear the debates because obviously, you know, it's one of the, the few things I think we, we disagree on on the podcast in terms of, you know, when, when and how much you should do of it. And Cam did a really good job of explaining um, that some of the, th the theoretical and empirical results around, you know, what that actually does. Because uh, I think a lot of the time we just take things on faith and say, yeah, well, this, this works. And I do a back test and it works, so I'm going to do it, which um, is the wrong attitude, frankly. You know, there's, you know that, that's, you, you go far enough down that road and, road and you're into data mining. Um, but the thing about volatility targeting is, is um, it's just so part of the DNA of, of the industry and, and the way we, we do stuff. We never really think about why it works or why it might dif work differently across different asset classes. So, so that that was one particular insight that was really really fascinating for me. Um, and the the other one was um, around um, rebalancing, mm. which again is it, it's just something that that I, I kind of take take into. Um, you know the the way that that I construct my trading systems is well basically I, I I'm essentially targeting expected risk, and that expected risk is going to be a function of, you know the the positions that I have and the risk of the market and also you know what, what I think in terms of will this market go up or down and by how much, and sort of effectively within that is is essentially a, a kind of permanent rebalancing because if nothing changes from day to day, which is unlikely, but you know. If nothing changes meaningfully from day to day, so risk stays the same, then then my I will rebalance rebalance that portfolio to, to maintain constant risk amongst the different components of it. And again, it's just something I've never really thought about deeply. It just just seemed to make sense. And Cam did a very good job of explaining how actually rebalancing effectively is bad in some ways because. You know, re re what, do, what do you do when you rebalance? Well, you sell things that have gone up and you buy things that have gone down in the absence of any other information about risk or, or forecasts. And, oh, well, you know what, that sounds exactly like the opposite of, of the, the gospel of trend following, right? We do the opposite, as we were just saying to the, the questioner. Market's going up, you should be buying, not selling. Well, are you some kind of idiot um, selling on the mar when the market's going up? So what that means is for people who, um, and this is, probably more related to sort of your, you know, your classic long only portfolio manager, your 60, 40 portfolio manager, mm. not so much for us because, you know, we're, we're going to be trading as trends, you know, the, the, the effect of trends essentially in our portfolio will overwhelm this rebalancing effect. Mm. But for a, a, someone who's not using any kind of trend following indicators, they're effectively running a sort of anti trend following portfolio without even realizing it. And depending on the frequency of their rebalancing, that, that can actually be damaging their, their portfolio quite a lot. Um, and Cam talked about how those people could use um, trend-following signals to actually time their rebalancing in an intelligent way, so they're not suffering this kind of permanent drag of, on returns. So, so that was the that was my two main takeaways. But yeah, it was, it was a I think it was a good ninety-minute solid conversation, and uh, I definitely recommend it. He's one of the the you know the most interesting guys out there, definitely. Yeah, no, absolutely, completely agree. I also want to say, by the way, that. The papers that Cam was referencing, um, we've actually put those in the show notes. So do go to the website, pick out the show notes. That's where you can find the papers. There are four of them that uh, uh, Rob kindly sent over to me and they're on the website now in the show notes for that episode. I had picked the same topic in my two sort of um, takeaways. Uh, definitely the volatility talking. That's obviously always something that we get excited about. The other one for me was really... And, and I'm not sure I kind of do it justice the way he explained it, but I kind of remember it as saying that a lot of managers focusing on quote unquote balancing or optimizing for return and volatility in designing their systems, but that you really need a third dimension in, in, in your design and that's skew. And, and, and actually the recent environment that we've been through, when you look at, I think, trend following returns, I think it's fair to say that, that we haven't really seen a lot of positive skew, probably on the contrary. it's I think it's sh shifted a bit so that a lot of the return streams have become a little bit more negatively skewed in some ways, which obviously is an argument for for the short-term guys that are better at delivering a positive skew in, in these kind of, um, kind of uh, one-day, two-day events that we've seen, um, like Black Friday, for example. So, so I thought it was an interesting point he made that whether we need to p 
pay more attention to that in our design of our strategies. I don't know if you, what you picked up from that point. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and I think um, to an extent, I think we we kind of take skew for granted as trend followers. We're like, oh, we're trend follow. That's positive skew. Mm. But I've spent quite a lot of time recently, um, and Cam, Cam's kind of kind of reminded me actually that you know when when he was at AHL. There was a meeting apparently, which I don't remember, but he remembers very clearly. But you know, I was in a lot of meetings, and and apparently we were reviewing a strategy that was potentially going to the portfolio. And I was on the part of him and said, "Well, hang on, guys, this is this is obviously negative skew." And I don't, I, I probably didn't even need to look at the the return profile because it just from the description of the strategy, it's obviously negative skew. This is not what our clients want. We should not be putting this into our portfolio. So that's the that's kind of the easy decision. Like if you want positive skew, don't do things that are obviously negative skew, but actually. It, it's actually um, not necessarily the case that trend following, particularly as you say, you know, past the kind of very fast trend following, it's not the case that it will automatically deliver positive skew. Um, and actually, um, it's just kind of an early, early insight from potentially from my book. I'm deciding whether it should go into the book or not. But um, I do, I've actually seen, um, did, did some long back tests and I, I'm seeing um, a sort of downward trend in skew. So, Early on in in the back tests, the this a lot of positive skew being delivered across the board, and that's kind of bl- sort of withering away over time. And um, yeah, so so I, this is something I've only just really looked into. So I, I haven't got, got you a kind of a, a message as to why this is the case or how to avoid it. Um, but but I do think it's the case that even as trend followers, we can't just take skew for granted. It's not necessarily going to automatically be delivered. Yeah, no, and I actually I'll definitely look forward to that chapter in particular when when you've done that because I do think it's an interesting phenomenon. But it could be just that this is just because of how the environment has been um, in in recent years that, and it's natural we go through these cycles and and so on and so forth. So I'm not necessarily sure that this will be a um, a uh, something that will continue um, and. And and frankly, obviously, it goes back to the whole point about trend following is that we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So it might be positively skewed for the next 10 years. Who knows? Anyways, now we're going to get to your topic uh, that you brought along for this week. And you wanted to talk about um, sort of st- static and dynamic optimization when you trade smaller accounts. So I'm going to um, leave you to talk about that and follow along as best I can. Okay, Niels, please, please feel free to jump in with questions or comments at any point because the last thing anyone wants is a, you know, a 45-minute monologue from me. So one of the main problems I have is that my account size is, is much smaller than, than sort of institutional size. So for a retail trader, it's you know, probably uh, reasonably large, um, but it's not, you know, it's not sort of tens or hundreds or billions of dollars, which is you know, what I used to play with on a regular basis back in, back in the day. And that that gives you some problems, and it's a problem that's particularly um, an issue for anyone who trades futures, um, because um, futures have some some nice properties, but also some unpleasant ones. Um, you can only trade whole futures contracts. Um, you know, you can't trade them in fractions, um, and some of those contracts are rather large um, in size. And um, the way I kind of think about size isn't so much in terms of like the notional value of the contract. Um, because that that's quite misleading. Because so, for example, if you take the the euro dollar future, the notional value is um, well, it depends how you calculate it, but it's it's two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars. That's multiplying the 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 the, the contract multiplier, which is a thousand dollars by the price. Sorry, it's two 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 thousand five hundred dollars by the price, which is about a hundred dollars. It's you know ninety nine dollars, whatever, and change. Um, if you take, say, a, a ten-year bond, then the the multiplier there again is a thousand dollars. The price is, you know, one hundred and forty maybe U.S. ten-year. I don't know exactly, one hundred and forty thousand dollars. But what the, the that sort of notional value doesn't actually tell you how risky it is. And if you're going to scale your positions according to risk on your initial entry, which is what we all do, then um, or according to ATR or some other measure of volatility. Those things aren't that risky. So, um, you know, your your US 10-year might have a standard deviation of maybe 5% a year. So the risk on on that 5% of $140,000 is what? $7,000, something like that. But you could have something um, which is, um, you know, not, not as big as that, but it has a huge amount of risk on it. 
An example would be the Ethereum futures contract, um, on which the annualized risk comes out to, I think the last time I checked, it was like $300,000. So the issue is this, um, that, well, we want, to tr we want to trade ideally. In an ideal situation, you'd be able to do a couple of things. The first thing you'd ideally be able to do is diversify across lots and lots of different instruments. And this, you know, we, we do bang on about it, and I bang on about it particularly, but diversification across different instruments really is, you know, the, on, the only free lunch in finance. Um, and it's particularly powerful in trend following. So one of the things I've been doing in my earlier chapters is comparing the performance of an average instrument to the aggregate performance of a large portfolio of instruments. And the, the improvement you see um, going to that aggregate is, is astonishing. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, you, you, you know, if you trend follow an individual instrument and you compare that to a sort of, you know, sort of buy and hold portfolio effectively, the improvement isn't really there. And if anything, you may even see a, you know, a degradation in performance for that average instrument. But if you can trend follow um, 150 of these things, then you see a, an astonishing improvement in, in performance. Um, and that's because the, the, um, the power of diversification and correlation, once you apply trend following, works even better. And that's because going long short on things automatically means the correlation will be lower than if you were just going long. Just That's just common sense or maths. So you get a much bigger diversification benefit from trading across multiple instruments. Now, obviously, if you've got a retail account, you just can't do that. You know, you can't, you can't mm -hmm. trade 150 futures contracts. It's just impossible. It would only be possible if they all were very low, you know, very low volatility, stroke, very low notional value. And that, that just isn't the case. You can do it with equities um, because equities, you know, kind of the sort of contract size in equities, which is basically the price, um, mm -hmm. is usually much lower. Um, so um, it's, it's a bit easier. So that's the first thing you can't do. The second thing you, you can't do is to um, actually do um, anything that sort of goes above and beyond the basic idea of, of buying futures contracts in terms of sizing positions, position sizing. So you kind of, let's say that you were trading, to take a stark example, the Ethereum contract and the, the US 10 year or the euro dollar on which, as I've already said, the risk is really quite different. It's very, very hard for you to trade them in the same way because you could probably, you know, with even with a retail-sized account, buy five or six contracts of US 10-year. And because you've bought five or six contracts, that means that you, you know, when the risk is different in the market, you can buy fewer contracts or more contracts. When you've got a different strength forecast, if you do what I do, which is when trends are stronger, buy bigger positions again. You've got the the kind of capability to do that because you've got options, right? You know, you can buy fewer or less than contracts. With something like Ethereum, it's really all or nothing. You know, um, you, you you can buy one contract. <laughs> doesn't matter how risky it is. Doesn't matter how strong the trend is. You know, you, you're stuck with that that very blunt on or off decision, binary decision. And um, you know, there are there are quite significant improvements you can make to a trading system. If you you aren't stuck with just a binary on-off decision, if it, you know, but going long or short one contract, you, you're going to end up with with a risk in your portfolio that's completely, you know, it's going to be completely wrong. You're not going to have a sixty forty portfolio or a fifty fifty portfolio. You're going to have a portfolio that's ninety nine percent Ethereum and one percent something else. Well, you might as well just buy and sell Ethereum. The one percent there is not going to really add anything. So you you can't get diversification across lots of instruments. And even if you're only, you've only got a few instruments, it's very hard to get diversification right. You don't really have a freedom of choice about how you allocate your risk to different instruments. It's very much going to be driven by what the contract size happens to be, which is, to an extent, is arbitrary. Am I making sense so far, Niels? Yeah, no, it makes sense. By the way, just because, of course, we know that with, with the crypto uh, contracts that they were certainly very large when they initially um, got launched, does the two mic because I think they're micro contracts now, both for Bitcoin and Ethereum. Does that change the the if you want to have exposure to crypto in your uh, in in your account? Um, has the micro um, so Ethereum contract? I, helped I haven't. A lot? I didn't actually know they launched a micro Ethereum. So that's good to know. Um, so I I trade the micro Bitcoin. I'm pretty sure they yeah, have. Yeah, actually, yeah. I'm pretty sure. So they have. generally speaking, um, the as long as the liquidity is there. 
Um, right. It's if you can trade if there are micro or, or mini contracts available, it's usually better to trade those. So, um, in fact, interestingly, um, quite I don't know how many people were aware of this, but quite recently the CME delisted the full size um, S and P five hundred contract. Yeah. Um, because nobody trades nobody it was anymore. trading it. Everyone was trading the mini yeah. and more recently the micro. Um, so mm. you know when you offer people smaller contracts, well, <laughs> you know there's not really a lot if the liquidity is there. There's not really a lot of benefit for for almost anybody to stay in the the bigger contract. So, and another contract that springs to mind, and and this is I could be wrong on this one, but you would know. And it's not so much I think the notional value that I'm focusing on here, but it's more I think the margin to equity. Palladium seems to ring a bell in terms of being a massive contract in terms of margin to equity requirements, just to trade one lot. So I think it's like forty thousand dollars to trade one lot. Yeah, so um, I've actually got a table in, in my new book, which we keep plugging in this episode, don't we? I'm sorry about I that. I know. Um, but it, it shows the, the largest contracts, and I am pretty sure that Palladium is the, the biggest con- risk contract, um, and even bigger than Ethereum. Yeah. So, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And and, and there's also, um, it was a currency in there as well, but I, I can't, I, I haven't got the table in front of me, so I won't, I won't sure say uh, things that might be incorrect. Uh, but yeah, so... You know, there are some micros, there are some minis, but in the, on the other hand, there are situations in which those minis and micros just aren't liquid enough, it's not worth, you know, or too expensive to trade. And uh, even even though that's the case, in some cases, in a lot of cases, it isn't. There's just only one choice of contract to trade, and you're you're kind of stuck with it. So this is the basic problem that that we as retail account traders right. have. And um, it, it does mean, for example, that... Well, you say retail, I mean, you say that, but actually... You know, we know that, for example, the assets in our industry is probably 95% concentrated with the top 5% managers. Yeah. So I actually don't think it's just individual investor who has an issue. I think a lot of small managers are facing some of these issues. So I do think it's really relevant. Yeah, I, I would say probably sub 50 million, you're going to have this problem. That right. would be my kind of finger in the yeah. air figure. Definitely sub sub 25, 10 million. Because people may not also fully appreciate, I mean, I think they, they, they will understand what you said when, when you talk about this conundrum that you could have too much risk in one, you know, by just trading one contract of something. But I think what people may not fully understand is that the rounding issue that you have when you go from one to two lots is so massive yeah. compared to going from 15 to 16 lots. That's the issue we face. Definitely. Um, so as a rule of thumb, um, with my kind of um, old trend following system, which I no longer train and I'll explain how I've changed it, um, I, I would say I, I would only be happy trading something if I can hold four contracts mm. with with the appropriate risk allocation and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, otherwise, you know, and um, you do get a benefit from being able to hold more. Um, but, but, um, yeah, the, the, the improvement from one to two to three to four is, is, is dramatic in terms of your expected mm. performance, because you can just have that much more granular control over your, your positions. Mm. So that's the problem anyway. So what, what are the solutions? Um, so the, the, um, the first, I'm going to present kind of three different, different, um, solutions to this problem. The first one um, I'm going to talk about quite quickly because it's it's very specific to the way my particular trading system works, and uh, it's it's a bit a little bit technical and 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 maybe not that interesting to a lot of people. So, but, but very very quickly, this is the way I used to deal with it with my original trading system. So effectively, if you think about it in your head, if you think about a graph which sort of shows the position you'd like to have on, the position you actually have on. That graph's going to look like a, a series of steps, isn't it? And though each of those steps is the the kind of contract going up one contract. Now, when I was at AHL, that that graph would have looked like a straight line hmm. because the the step sizes were so small <laughs> in most cases that you couldn't even have seen the the kind of discontinuity on the the light, sort of pixelation on the line, if you like. For me now, for something like Ethereum, that that's just one massive step, <laughs> effectively. Um, so what what I tried to, to what I said was well this this sort of step um, function is kind of it's effectively a, a a product of the exact contract size and it it it's a bit kind of random right it's a bit stochastic in some cases you'd buy that full contract when you you had almost your maximum forecast on in other cases you'd buy it when you had a small forecast on so it, it's it's a bit accidental so what I I did was say well let let me kind of make it more deliberate and basically 
effectively what it is is a form of thresholding and basically I don't buy I wouldn't buy a contract until I, my my forecast had reached a certain strength now that would happen anyway naturally as a result of the system just rounding but what I said was well rather than making that accidental and that that kind of step up happening you know at some arbitrary point I'd actually say well actually I'm going to be very very specific and say when my forecast reaches a certain level of strength I will then at that point buy that contract and that was then calibrated such that you know it worked for the particular instrument I was trading now that that kind of is a little bit of a it doesn't solve the problem it makes the problem go away in some instruments that are marginal so instruments where I couldn't have four contracts but where I could have two I'd introduce this step function so at least although I knew I was having this this rounding problem at least it was on my terms you know I knew I knew when I'd be buying that that one on that second contract but it wasn't ideal and it really only helped things at the edges and it made the system more complex and so let's let's move on from that the second thing you can do is to trade in a sort of normal way but to do so with a limited set of instruments and this is what I mean by static optimization, because what you basically do is you, you, you run a sort of optimization, but you run it once, and that basically then produces for you the list of instruments that you actually can trade that is optimal for a given level of capital. So I'm going to sort of very briefly describe how this optimization works, but, but, but any kind of optimization, we have to think about, well, what are we trying to optimize? And what are our inputs? What do we think is going to, going to affect our results? So what I think are important, well, obviously contract size is important because that's what we're talking about. So we have to think about that. Um, we have to think about costs because, um, you should, because we're buying risk sell scale positions, that means we should always think about costs in risk-adjusted terms. And actually, interestingly, um, all of the things being equal, the, the bigger a contract is, the cheaper it will be to trade. Um, because the bigger contracts are riskier and therefore on a risk-adjusted basis are actually cheaper to trade. So, um, you know, there's, there's this sort of trade-off between contracts that are af smaller contract sizes. So, for example, a lot of the short-term interest rate futures, the shorter bonds, tend to have less risk. But then on the other hand, on a risk-adjusted basis, that means they're more expensive. So, you know, as a, as a, as a small, someone with a smaller account size, you've kind of got the double whammy of not being able to diversify, but also the things you can trade tend to be more expensive to trade, mm. which isn't the end of the world. You can trade them a bit slower, um, but, but it, it, obviously it's a bit of a pain. So costs matter, contract size matter, things like liquidity. Um, and I've talked about this in a previous episode. You know, I have hard filters for these things. There are, there are contracts I wouldn't even consider that would go into this optimization. Um, and then basically what the optimization does is it, it it kind of says, well, what's the the best thing I can trade? And that would be something that's pretty cheap, has a reasonably small contract size. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter what that first instrument is. You know, you, you, can't, you can, as long as it fits those bills roughly, you just pull it out of the hat. And then what it does is it iterates. It says, well, what's the net? What, what should I add now? Okay. Well, you want to add something that has certain properties. It wants to be not too expensive to trade. It wants to be diversifying. So if you've already mm -hmm. got, say, I don't know, gold futures, you probably don't want to be adding silver next. Um, you don't want to be adding platinum for the reasons we've discussed, but you probably don't want to be adding silver because that's quite correlated. You'd probably want to be looking at other asset classes. Um, and also you, you want the contracts, you want the, the contract size to be reasonably small. So you are going to get this, this discretization. And basically what the, the method I've produced, which is on my blog, you can download the code. It'll be in my book as well, but it's on the blog for free. Um, just, just essentially gradually builds the portfolio, builds the portfolio until the expected risk adjusted return, the sharp ratio has started to, has kind of peaked and started to fall slightly. Um, and the reason I do that rather than the absolute peak is because there's a bit of noise around the top. You know, you, you don't right. know exactly where you are. Um, so if I run that with my my current um, account size, which is about half a million dollars roughly, um, it would say, well, these it comes up with a list of about 30 or so instruments, that mm, you can track, which is okay. pretty good. Yeah. And uh, that, you know, look at them, you look at them and they're, they're kind of, it makes sense in the sense that, all oh, right, there's a good spread of cross asset classes. The costs aren't too bad. You're getting, you know, in some cases, quite a few contracts you can trade. In other cases, you're only you can only trade a couple of contracts. But the the, the optimization is saying, well, although normally I prefer four, it's saying two is okay in this particular case because it, it's 
it all works. Um, and the nice thing about that is because it's a um, it's an optimization, it's automatic. It means you, you can just push a button and it, it does it. Mm -hmm. um, it also means that um, it's hopefully freer freer of kind of any biases, human biases that I might have. And um, one one project I have to do, and we'll get around to eventually, hopefully, is to run that optimization regularly for a number of different account sizes and then publish the results so people can go and say, well, mm. say you've got a $100,000 account, what should you trade? You know, what looks good at the moment? Um, you know, just, just as a, a starting point. So that's the, the static optimization. So I will, again, pause, Niels, and ask you if that's clear, if you have any questions or... No, no. I mean, I think it 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 makes sense to uh, to think about it in in that way and trying to kind of expand your uh, your your portfolio uh, to to quote unquote to a to a level where it seems to um, to give you you could say the the most um, value for money, meaning you get as much diversification as you can afford, um, given the limitations. So yeah, no. I for, I mean, for me, it makes it makes sense to to look at it that way. But I'm excited about the last point. <laughs> well, this is this is where um, you know uh, probably um, Jerry at least will will be you know choking on his. Uh, is he going to fall off the treadmill <laughs> again gonna today? Fall. He's going to be okay. shouting at shouting at the uh, shouting at the, the the smart speaker and turn off. I don't want to hear any more of Rob talking this highfalutin nonsense. Alexa, <laughs> Alexa, turn off Rob. Let's stop. Okay, so I thought. I, to myself, there must be a way of of actually trading 140 futures markets, say, which is what I'd like, you know, wow. I'd like to trade. That's mm -hmm. roughly how many I think are out there that are liquid, meet my liquidity and cost requirements and that I can access the market data and so on and so forth. There must be a way of doing that with only half a million dollars of only, you know, with say half. I have one solution for you afterwards, but <laughs> I want to hear yours first. Okay. Um, with only half a million dollars of capital, there must be there must be a way of doing this. So, um, and uh, I have to say that that um, I I probably I think I wrote about three, four, four maybe four. I think it was four in the end. Four blog posts on this, and I kind of had to battle my way to a, a, a solution, and it took a while. Um, and actually, I was um, helped by someone on on Twitter um, who who um, said I've got a way that works, and just uh, DM'd me and with a solution. I'm, wow, this is this is brilliant. This is I love this solution. It's very simple. Anyway, the idea is this. We run our trading system as if we've got 140 instruments that we're trading and no we don't and no issues around rounded contract sizes. So every day my system because I, I trade daily. Every day my system will produce a long list of positions it would have. And most of those positions are things like, you know, 0 0.003 Ethereum contracts or, you know, right. minus 0 0.2 euro dollar contracts, things like that. You know, there's probably not going to be a single number above one in that whole list. So if I was to just then put that into my my old system, it would it would say, oh, no trading today because, <laughs> you know, there's literally, there's no, you, you know, there's nothing, you can't do it. You just can't do it. The roundings just completely destroyed your, your portfolio. Makes the implementation very easy. It does, easy, yeah. I mean, so, you don't have to worry yeah. about There's some benefits the ex to execution it. algorithm or, you know. <laughs> no positions yeah, every life, day. Life. What's yeah. your, make the podcast quite boring though, wouldn't it? Like, it so would, what's your um, PNL, Rob? This is zero, actually. And, and your risk, uh, it's also zero. So, but then what you say is, um, you basically say, well, I want to have um, the portfolio that is as close as possible to that portfolio, mm -hmm. but actually achievable. And it's ach achievable means that I'm saying I can only take whole number contract positions. So it's an optimization. And mm -hmm. it, but I call this a dynamic optimization because unlike the static optimization, where you basically pick your set of, say, 30 futures markets you're going to trade, put them in your system, and then you just let it run and it just runs every day normally. This is doing an optimization every single day. And it's basically saying, I want to get as close as I can to this theoretical portfolio, which is full of all these fractional positions, but knowing I can only trade whole numbers. So, you know, the, the technical details, uh, again, they're on the blog. You feel free to go into it. But but um, just, just very broadly, what it's actually doing is minimizing something called tracking error, which sort of people on the institutional side will be very familiar with. 
But basically, that, that's a measure of how far apart the optimal portfolio is and the portfolio I'd like to have that takes into account the, the, the correlation structure and, um, and the standard deviations of the various assets. So basically, what it's saying is, I want to, to minimize the risk um, the difference in risk between the op- the optimal portfolio, which is I can't have, um, and mm. the, the portfolio I'm kind of hunting for, if you like, and um, the the algorithm it uses, which, and this is the innovation that that, that the guy on Twitter came with. It uses something called the greedy algorithm, um, which sounds very um, very weird, but the, very, very appropriate. appropriate. Like but the way it works is basically it it um, it starts from assuming you've got no starts from zero, saying right, I'm going to start from a position of zero, and then it gradually iterates and, and and adds positions in various parts of the portfolio until it gets to the point where things can't improve anymore. So it's actually very similar to what I described for static optimization. Mm-hmm. Things can't improve anymore, and then it's like, right, this is the best portfolio. This is the best portfolio you can hold. So intuitively, how that might work is, for example, if I've got long positions in most equities, and I've got short positions in most bonds, say, and let's assume that everything else is flat, that's the, op- the optimal portfolio I can't hold. What will come out is I'll end up being long equities that have a fairly small contract size, and I'll be end up shooting short bonds that have a small contract size. And that might mean I'm long, you know, 10 equity markets and short 10 bond markets. And that that portfolio, because the equities and bonds between themselves are very correlated, because they, you know, the, the correlation, the cross correlation is probably quite similar, that portfolio will kind of represent things well. And there are a lot of an awful lot of additional things around, for example, costs. So it does this optimization mm. in the presence of costs. There's also uh, something called buffering, which which means is a, a way of reducing trading costs, which means you don't actually go all the way to the optimal portfolio. You just go some of the way. Again, the details are on my blog, or they'll be in my book if you want to wait for that. So for for people who are interested, that that's the basic idea. Now, th- th- it's important to stress that 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 um, this is actually quite a big departure from <laughs> from you know the way that the the sort of mm. straightforward you know the nice thing about trend following systems CTAs generally unlike you'd know, say equity long short managers in the hedge fund space for whom this kind of dynamic optimization is their meat and bread they 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 tend to do this um a lot um, it's fairly standard in that world we tend not to do it. And uh, if I was running a, a 50, 100 million, million dollar, multi-billion dollar fund, I wouldn't do it either. It's only because I've got this small account size uh, issue mm. that, that I'm doing it. Because it does add complexity. It does reduce the intuition of the system. You need to have very a very, very good set of diagnostics to understand what this optimization is actually doing. You need to spend a lot of time looking at the back test and understanding the properties. Um, your code... Your code needs to be absolutely top notch because the the consequences of failure are very high um, compared to static optimization. And I've actually got some experience with a similar kind of optimization process, not exactly the same, but earlier in my career. So I'm 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 you know I'm not coming from a place of complete complete novice at this. So um, so that's all the kind of caveats and warnings around around this. But but yeah, for for people who are um, experienced and, and willing to, to, to go down this route, it does seem to, to work quite well as a way of, kind of getting more leverage out of your, you know, your, 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 your smaller account size. Now, I think I'm going to send a message to the producer that he's going to be titling this episode, Don't Try This at Home. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. No, it's, uh, it's very, very much the, the advanced stuff. But the, re- the reason I thought I'd talk about it is because um, it's probably the main... It, it, I've been trading my own money now for um, seven and a half years, I think, and I've. This is the the only real change I've made to my system, and it's a huge change. Have you made the change? Yeah, already? yeah, I made I made the change probably um, about a month ago or so. So um, it it's and and yes, in case anyone's wondering, I would still have lost about the same amount of money last month if I hadn't oh, made that's the change. Be my next, question. I did check that. Yeah, no, that's the one thing you always think. Oh bloody hell! I don't drive. So the classic thing is you make a change and the, the new system underperforms the old system. That this this is what tends to happen. Um, but but in this case it hasn't really made much difference. So so yes, Neil, I'm sure you have many, many questions.
I do have some questions. I mean, first of all, I I think it's it's a really interesting approach, uh, and of course, as you say, this is uh, pretty advanced stuff. Um, I'm curious to know when you look at your back test using this methodology, and of course, this is a back test, so all the caveats and and all of that, of course. But how does that look compared to what you were able to do beforehand? Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, it's actually it's actually harder than you might think to answer. And one of the reasons for that is, um, if you just look purely at the historic performance, if I though the because of the way my static algorithm works in terms of choosing instruments, um, it tends to choose instruments that have done very well in the back test. And that's not because it's looking for instruments that have done well in the sure. back test. Because I've said many times in this podcast that I don't, I you know, as well we said earlier, you couldn't. So you shouldn't try and time strategies. Similarly, it's very hard to pick instruments to say, oh, this one's going to do better at trend following than this one. I absolutely don't believe that's the case. It's just a coincidence that because if you look at things like that have low risk, like the short-term bonds, for example, like the interest rate futures, over the last 40 years, they've had the best long-only performance and therefore they've also had the best trend following performance because those same things tend to go together. Um, so that means that the the, the static optimization will tend to pick a, a portfolio that looks amazing in the back test, but that's complete a complete accident. And importantly, um, I don't expect that to to continue into the future. Mm. So it's very important when evaluating the performance to not just look at the the historic sharp and compare them, but to actually um, you know do things like regressions and look at alpha and out performance and so on and so forth. Having said all that, it's it is better. And in that, and that, without without doing all of that stuff, it's still better. If I if I do it kind of properly, then it's it's a hell of a lot better. Um, so to give you a feel, in very rough terms, the static optimization has a sharp ratio in back to say one, say roughly. Pretty solid. Yeah. Now, if I could run 150 futures with no worries about rounding issues, mm-hmm. I'd be looking at a sharp of about 1.5. Wow. With this dynamic optimization, it's about 1.4. So it's not as good, good. as the un, you know the portfolio I could have with a load of money because the dynamic optimization obviously doesn't perf- can't perfectly sure. replicate the underlying portfolio, but it's it's getting you know me kind of 80 percent of the way there. So it's that's the other thing, right? This is a lot of complexity and risk, operational risk I'm adding to my system. Mm. it's not worth doing that for five sharp five sharp ratio points it has to right. give you a, a very substantive benefit to consider that and that's true of any any change or complexity you add to your system i mean that's that's significant uh so well done on that my, my only other question i think for today would be so so you are basically now so what's the most quote-unquote obscure market you're so these are all futures right so give me a feel for some of the these uh, really weird markets, and I say weird in a positive way, of course, that you're now going to be able to have in your portfolio one day when you wake up, you would actually have to say, yeah, it's selected uh, milk, for example, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, so, um, goodness me, there are there are so many, uh, <laughs> so many weird weird markets. Let me let me just have a, a very a very quick uh, look at my report. So, it would be things like, for example, uh, Japanese real estate. Um, the Indian rupee FX future cheese. Mm-hmm. I've got a lot of the, um, I've got, for example, Ethereum, although I think it's unlikely I'll end right. up with an actual position in Ethereum because the contract's so huge. But one of the benefits of this method is I can still trade, I can still like form an opinion on where Ethereum's going to go. Right. And that will go into my optimization. So for example, if, if Ethereum's trending up, it's telling me, crypto's going up, the optimization will then say, well, how can I actually express that opinion in, in, in whole numbers of futures mm, contracts? Mm. I'll probably end up buying a bit more Bitcoin. So that that's mm. an example of yeah. how that can yeah. inform my, my decision. Similarly, we talked about platinum. I'm tracking the price of uh, palladium, palladium. Sorry, palladium. palladium. I'm tracking the price of palladium. It's unlikely yeah. I'll buy a whole contract because it's just so huge. But on the other hand, mm. I'll probably end up buying other precious metals like more gold and more silver as a result, which I can trade. Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean the the list the list goes on. Yeah, milk's on there. I've got a lot of uh, these um, sector futures, um, equity sector futures. Mm-hmm. Oh, right, um, so for example, yeah. also I can have things I'm not even legally allowed to trade. 
So I've got the U- the US sector futures are in my optimal portfolio. But one of the things mm. my my sis- my actual trading system, the optimization knows is, oh, Rob, you can't trade those. So I'm not even going to put those into your portfolio. But again, if I'm long all of the of the US sector futures, I'll probably go a bit longer S&P or Russell or, or NASDAQ. Mm. You know, if I'm long US tech, well, I'll buy more NASDAQ because I can trade NASDAQ. So, and also there are things that are too expensive or illiquid for me to trade, as I talked about in previous episodes. Again, they're in the optimization. But again, I won't even try and trade those because I know that, that the, although the optimization does take account of costs, I still don't want to you know, be trading those markets at all. They just don't meet my filter. So the only things that aren't in that big optimization are duplicate contracts. So for example, I don't have both the S&P mini and the S&P micro because then I'd be effectively dubbed. They're the same thing. You know, the correlation is 100%. Yeah, sure. So there's no point in having both of those in there. I just I just have the S&P 500 micro. I then go and trade the S&P 500 micro because obviously that's got quite a small contract size. So yeah, uh, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's the... The Japanese Mother's Equity Index. Do you know this one? The Japanese Mother's Equity yeah. Index? No, no they've idea. got this no. this index named Mother's. I've, I've, I've no idea why. Um, okay. I, I, call, I use my own system of, um, of tickers. Um, I've, I could never remember the Bloomberg codes um, or the CME codes that other people use, so I use my own. So that one, I've given the ticker Mummy. Right, which, of which course. Which I think yeah. makes sense. What's the funniest ticker the funniest you have ticker. in your list other than mummy? Uh, oh, I'll tell you what it is actually. So um, the you know oats, dry dry rolled oats, which are now trading. Mm-hmm. So I yeah. I eat them for breakfast, but there we are. I already have the um, the French bond in my system, right? Which is O-A-T. OAT. So my I had the code oat for the French bond. So I thought I've got to add oats. I can't have oat and oats because it just you know. To, to, so actually, I've called them OTs, O A T I E S. I mean, to be honest, because it's just I would have gone for goat. goat. <laughs> it's a grain, and it's yeah. An oat. But then, what if goat. someone starts trading a goat future, like a future on the price of goat meat or camel, or yeah, you know, goat, then I would have gone for goat. goat. Actually, you know what? Actually, um, I, I'm I'm thinking that my list of tickers is actually quite boring because I I probably. Uh, because it's just my system, you know, I could just use anything. Here's here's an idea. You should uh, announce a competition on your blog for the most outrageous ticker symbols uh, or ticker codes for your new program. I think that would be a, a home yeah, run, actually. Actually, that's a good idea. Because so, there's a list of about 50 yeah. or so markets. I still haven't set them on my system because it's a... There so, we are. Yeah. And you should, uh, you should give a price out to the ones who come up with the best... Uh, well, Let's you know what? Samples. We can we can do this now. So I'm I'm really I'm re- let me just quickly uh, uh, let, read off a few of the, the the ones I'm planning to add to my my system in the, in the near future. So uh, I've got the 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 Gix index. I've got a whole bunch of housing indices, uh, U.S. housing indices. Mm-hmm. I've got the Hungarian forint, which is obviously FX. Should be hunger. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got um, I've already got milk, but I'm I'm looking at the other milk contract, which is Class Four milk. Um, skinny yeah could be could be um i've got the the polish lottie <laughs> i've got the uh taiwanese dollar i've got uh, hot rolled co- coil steel i've got uranium so there's a few there for listeners to be to be getting on with absolutely i think the listeners get the yeah. picture feel free to tweet um and uh and we'll we'll make a little yeah. happening there now i don't want to spoil your thunder i think but, this has yeah, been absolutely but you have amazing. A, a much simpler way of doing but it but <laughs> i will i will just say that since you've been plugging your yeah. blog i want to plug the post that i just mentioned earlier today it. because actually it does exactly the same thing as all your um very complicated optimization because what rich and i did was we wrote basically a um, an explanation as to how you can select with the same account size half a million dollars that's very coincidental just select five managers every year keep them for one year we give the methodology for doing so and i bet you you get exposure to 140 different markets uh, in doing so so that's another solution if you don't want to do um all the coding yeah. yourself i mean we say we but, say uh, this on we said this before on the podcast that, that if and if you haven't got you know uh, a reasonable account size, then obviously investing with a manager is is probably the optimal solution. Uh, without yeah. all the, 
but it just happens to be the same yeah. account yeah. size we used but, and the same Neil, idea think of and all, all of that the hours stuff. I, yeah. I spend programming and and you know, uh, I know and looking I at my system really bad I, now. I could have just you know given up and just could have just read our just blog your blog and given yeah. my money to some yeah. some outside managers well there we are that may that be a lesson for you rob there we are <laughs> but what would i have to talk about Niels, if i i was just invested in outside managers i know we don't it want make to the do podcast that, rob. Don't, pretty don't. boring when i was on it would it would so i appreciate that that actually was really really interesting i have to say i learned a lot from uh, from that and uh, i had no idea really that that you could achieve that um so well done let me quickly run down some numbers uh, as we always do. Uh, beta 50 so far in December up 1.2%, up 10.6% for the year. So actually a pretty good trend following year for that uh, index. Uh, Sockgen CT index up 83 basis points as of yesterday, up 6.7% for the year. Trend index up 1.34, um, up 10% for the year. So also another good year, better than last year so far by a little uh, bit. And the SockGen Short-Term Traders Index up quarter percent um, for the month and up 1.17% for the year. Of course, MSCI World still a little bit ahead, up 2.8% for the month, up 18.5% for the year. And the World Government Bond Index is down a little bit so far this month. In closing out, um, of course, if you like these conversations, one thing you can do to support us is to leave a rating and review. And they're um, they're just so helpful. You have no idea because the algorithms pick them up. I also want to remind you, we've already plugged that a few times, that this week, actually, all of us will get together and we're going to kind of record a year-end special. It'll probably come out as two episodes on December 25th and January 1st. Um, so we don't, uh, we're not going to do any live recording uh, over those two weekends uh, due to the holidays. But I think hopefully this will be an epic um, session where we can really battle out some of these things. And I don't know, have you picked your protective gear already? You're going to be wearing. I'm going to just, you know, put on my my Santa hat and um, you know, and hope that the fact that I'm several hundred or thousand miles away from from the other other people will protect me. Um, but yeah. Okay. I have a feeling that should yeah. be enough, actually. Anyway, next week I'm joined. Uh, Harry Christmas is back for another interesting conversation, probably on portfolio construction and protection. So I'm going to be looking forward to that. Make sure you send in your questions. As always, info at toptradersonplug.com and we'll try and uh, answer them. As uh, as we talked about today, make sure you uh, take up Rob's challenge uh, in terms of ticker symbols. We do want to have some fun as well uh, in this trend-following world. So I think um, with that said, from Rob and me, thanks ever so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you next week. And in the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.